I've now had my fourth client get indefinite leave to remain on the Innovator visa. Um, so that's great news and I've got some more insights um, for you. Now the area that I want to focus on is what happens if you've been outside of the UK for more than 180 days in any rolling 12 month period? I have had now experience of uh, dealing with this issue, dealing with a case where someone has, has had more than um, 180 days out. So let's look at what happened. First of all, I'll start with the rules though. Now, the rules say the applicant must have spent at least three years in the UK with permission on the innovator route. And it's for the applicant to prove. So the applicant must prove that they've met the continuous residence requirements as set out in the appendix. Now, the continuous uh, residence requirements are met if the applicant has spent the qualifying unbroken uh, continuous residence uh, period required. And to meet the continuous residence requirement, the applicant must not have been outside of the UK for more than 180 days in any 12 month period. Now, this is the crucial part. When calculating the 180 days, any period spent outside of the UK for certain reasons will not count towards the 180 day limit. So, and those reasons include this. So travel disruption due to natural disaster, military conflict or pandemic. In other words, COVID. Um, or compelling and compassionate personal circumstances such as the life-threatening illness of the applicant or life-threatening illness or death of a close family member. Now, I have had a case now where it's involved um, all of these factors. So you had COVID and um, also personal illness and then um, uh, illness of a family member. So let's look at how we can navigate this. Now, so some people seem to be under the misapprehension that the Home Office somehow knows what, what your travel is from you going you know, over the border. That's not necessarily the case. The burden of proof is on you. Um, to prove your residence in the UK. Um, you can apply for a subject access request to get the information that the uh, border force has on you, um, but typically that's not complete anyway, and uh, it's not determinative. So I think just as a basic principle, what I, what I do with my clients is I have a schedule, um, I'm gonna make this available uh, 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 for free shortly, where uh, it has a formula that I've put in which will calculate uh, your absences. Uh, I've seen some other ones like this, but I want to do one that's specifically for the Innovator Visa. Yeah, so essentially it's for you to, to uh, prove when you've been in the UK and you should be keeping track of your absences. You don't need to count the day that you leave the UK and you don't need to count the day that you come back into the UK. So in each case, it's minus two, if you like, when you leave and when you come back in. Typically, there's also a period at the beginning. So you can count the period from when you get the entry clearance grant, that uh, vignette stamp in your passport, from, uh, from that date to when you come in, that's going to be uh, you know, an absence. So you have to bear that in mind. And some people come in, they pick up their biometric residence permit and then they leave straight away. Um, so yeah, you've got to be careful about managing your absences, but, be, but in particular, any delay before you come into the UK, but after the uh, entry clearance vignette has been put in your passport. And the reason that's important is you don't get any buffer on that three year period. So with some other visas, you get a buffer on the on the end, but here you get exactly three years. So you need to be using that full three years. Therefore, you need to use the period at the very beginning, even when you weren't actually in the UK. So you need to use that period before you got into the UK. And that period is going to be uh, counted as an absence. So lots of people within the last three years have, of course, been affected by COVID. And it's, it's a bit odd in the guidance that they ref they're referring to a, a, a pandemic, but there's no express reference to COVID like there is in, say, the settled status um, guidance. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a bit anomalous. It, it's as if it doesn't... <laughs> It doesn't recognize that uh, COVID took place. There's just this kind of buried reference to, to a pandemic. So um, how do you approach this kind of evidentially? Well, my approach is that I, I like to approach things at the very beginning as if you're preparing it for, uh, for an appeal, because these are the sorts of cases where you, you know, if you get a refusal, you want to have the option to appeal and you should make sure that all of the information has been before the initial decision maker 
so you don't have to submit fresh evidence later on. If you submit fresh evidence later on, if you get refused and you have to go before a judge, sometimes the matter will have to be remitted or adjourned for to, to be redecided anyway. It could have um, all kinds of consequences and it's inefficient from a project management perspective. So basically, prepare as if you are going before uh, an immigration judge, if you like. And um, that means being, being very comprehensive. So it, what I do is effect, prepare effectively statements from the people, the, the people uh, involved and including from the medical professionals. Um, now, sometimes with COVID tests, people don't keep the COVID tests and there's little evidence, especially from, from overseas. So you should be sure to, uh, yeah, to gather any records uh, uh, together of any absences. The more time that passes, the more difficult it is to get records sometimes and the weaker people's recollection um, is. Um, there may, it may be that family members uh, have uh, the ability to give sta statements as well. They might have been close to the facts. But let's say there was a situation where you yourself didn't have COVID, but a family member did, and you had to look after that family member. It might be that there's no kind of corroborating medical evidence. It might be it's just you and the family member confirming what happened. Uh, but uh, but yeah, but be comprehensive about it. So I've now had success, as I say, in a case where someone was way over the 180 days. Um, in fact, on more than one occasion, and uh, God willing, we uh, we're, we're still able to get the the application through. Um, essentially, those absences over and above the 180 days are deemed not to count if it was due to a pandemic or compelling or compassionate personal circumstances. This is a sort of heavily discretionary area. So the more you can say, uh, the better. So I'll be doing, I'll be doing a, another video on Innovator ILR shortly as I'm kind of refining uh, my approach to it. Um, I'm acting really for clients who, who I represented uh, three years ago uh, when the Innovator Room first opened and I've assisted them right through to where they're now applying for indefinite leave to remain. Um, but I'm also acting for some people who I didn't act for necessarily at the beginning, who um, I'm now assisting with their ILR applications. And yeah, for those, for those cases, I think it's important to start with a, a sort of gap analysis to see where the potential weaknesses are with the, uh, with the uh, intended ILR application. I hope that's helpful and bye for now.